Call center findings alarming. West Papuans face another eviction attempt. And border facility to open next month. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for your company for Wednesday's news. The, free call, the first free call counseling hotline in the country is concerned at the high number of family-related violence reported daily. With its establishment in August 2015, the One Talk Counseling Help Him Line has recorded over 2,000 calls of abuse, physical violence and threats to harm. Project officer Wesh Siku told MTV the hotline has been helpful but also paints a picture of the welfare status of individuals across communities in PNG. Just over a year after being established, an alarming data has been recorded by the Free Call Center. In its first year of operation, over 2,576 calls have been reported with high concerns of family and sexual violence abuse, with nearly three quarters of those calls resulting in counseling sessions and referrals. One of the functions of, of the counseling center was to provide information to people who call in to seek information. And secondly, uh, when a survivor calls into the counseling center, they provide safety planning. And thirdly, they, they provide crisis counseling. They provide crisis counseling to survivors and also they provide uh, suicide intervention to callers who call into the counseling center. The One Talk Counseling Help Him line has been helpful with confidential counseling and referrals of people seeking help. However, the center is also conscious of the shocking increase in emotional abuse, physical violence and threats to harm reported by callers. Interestingly, the data recorded shows that both survivors of abuse and perpetrators of violence are using the hotline service for help. We have here the trained counselors and experienced counselors who are who are many in our counseling center. So when this when they receive these calls, they were in a position to respond to their calls and help uh, assist the, the survivors. Project officer Wes Siku says calls have come all over the 22 provinces of the country, with highest number of calls from Central, Southern Highlands, Chimbu, East Sipik, and Morobe province. The hotline service is in its infant stages, however, is critical in minimizing and addressing the extreme rates of violence that exist in communities around PNG. If it means to, to reduce the number of incidents that is happening within the country, we have to do a lot of advocacy, do a lot of awareness to bring down the rate of domestic violence or gender-based violence which is happening throughout the country. The project is a partnership between Child Fund PNG, CIMC, FH360 New Zealand Aid, USAID Child Fund New Zealand and Child Fund Australia. Jack LaPave, Jr. National, MTV News. Distraught West Papuan refugees in Port Moresby are pleading with the PNG government to send them to a third country following yet another eviction attempt. The refugees say the eviction attempt and the court battle that they are pursuing over the property under dispute shows a distinct lack of government support to them as refugees. <laughs> The eviction exercise began around midday today on a property in Port Mosby by members of the Hohola police station. Donatus Karuri has been living on this property for over 30 years. No got one place eviction order come the top side was by me play out. And morning the police come on the eviction order. Meeting this eviction order must come one week or one month or by me play to regular pick up one. The property, Section 3, Allotment 33 in Hohola, has become an informal refugee camp for West Papuans who have come to PNG seeking safety and protection. Recently, the property has come under dispute, forcing the refugees to go to court to maintain their right to remain on the property. Last month, when MTV visited the property, the refugees said they are aware of an eviction notice issued by the district court and were challenging it in the national court. 
On August 8, 2016, a national court order stayed the eviction from being carried out. This order was what saved the refugees from being homeless today. Lawyer Asha Wafi brought a copy to show the policeman to stop the eviction exercise, saying it is illegal and in contempt of court. Donato said this eviction attempt and the fact that they are representing themselves in court shows the lack of PNG government concern over their plight. <laughs> More than 50 men, women and children live on this property. Some of the school children had to be taken out of school today to prepare to vacate their home, which fortunately for them didn't happen this time. While the title of the property is a matter before the courts, the bigger questions remain. How best will the PNG government provide practical support towards people who have been recognized as refugees and are living on PNG soil? Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. The Mobile District Development Authority has installed MTV transmitters in the district. The district has become the first to do this in the Western Highlands. Today, the infrastructure was displayed during the opening of a classroom at the Kumdi Primary School. MTV's Bethany Harriman and cameraman Mason Hungito are in Mubaya and bring us this story. Mubaya is opening up at a rapid pace. The district now has two transmitters, one in Mool and one in Baya. The people will only have to switch on their televisions and they will receive free-to-air programs. It comes when MTV continues to diversify and information becomes critical to the development of Papua New Guinea. Mool Baya district has taken steps to ensure its people are better informed, something that could be replicated by other districts in Papua New Guinea. The SIV, my name and easy, easy, look up. Five million kina people are kissing pennies. Nanata five million kina by and back before end of the year. People are working more little commitment, people are working and deliver him now. Mulbaya MP Koi Trappes says the district used funding from its own coffers to make things happen. The district funded the installation of the MTV transmitters. So you may must clear, Lord Israel. I'm all the money, I'm no money below me. Now you will like looking TV. People have put in tower and one million kina. Mulbaya villagers will now have MTV broadcast right into the house line of family. They become the first district in the Western Highlands outside of Mount Hagen to have the infrastructures. Bethany Hariman, National MTV News, Mulbaya. The Wutung border facility in Sundown province is set to open next month. This was announced by BDA Chairman Fred Conga. Mr. Conga said due to certain issues along the border, the official opening was delayed. The facility is a pilot project for BDA and funded by the Asian Development Bank. The facility was constructed four years ago and was completed last year. It is the first state-of-the-art border and customs facility aimed to improve border management between PNG and Indonesia. The delay in its official opening was due to discussions with the Indonesian government on border issues that were still outstanding. Come September, the new facility will be open and this will enable the Border Development Authority and other agencies to control the movement of goods and people across the border more effectively. Meanwhile, BDA has appointed six new board members. This is the second board since the Border Authority was first established. BDA Chairman Fred Conga said with the new board in place, similar plans for developing the other five border provinces of the country will now come into effect. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. The Constitutional Office Holders Benefit Act 1986 was this afternoon declared inconsistent with the Constitution. The order was handed down by Justice Nicholas Kiriwom on the proceeding involving retirement benefits for Sir Makeno Geno. The court ordered that the act is inconsistent because it did not provide a time limit on when the retirement payment should stop. Parties involved in this application are Sir Makeno Geno as the applicant and the Solicitor General as the defendant. 
This proceeding was filed at the Supreme Court for the court's interpretation on the rights and entitlements of constitutional office holders. Semakeno's employment contract with the public service ended in 1998, and he started receiving his pension payments also in 1998 up till the year 2000. His pension payment ceased after the Office of the Auditor General received a legal advice stating that Sema Keno was only entitled for a 12-year pension. And also I want to say thank you to my lawyer uh, who has done a very good submission uh, that was put before the court and uh, uh, not only my lawyer but also the, the lawyer from Justice Department. Sam Akeno's lawyer submitted that the 12-year pension in this act is not adequate and suitable according to the Constitution, while the Solicitor General argued that the issue of adequacy and suitability in this pension scheme cannot be assessed by the law. I'm very pleased that uh, that is the way it was done today, uh, and my congratulations to the judges who sat on the bench because it also affects them too as constitutional office holders. They are constitutional office holders like myself. But I, I think uh, they did an excellent job. They must be congratulated. However, this afternoon, the five-man Supreme Court bench reached a unanimous decision that the act was unconstitutional. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. You're at National MTV News. We have stories from Maprik, Yanguru Saucia and Kokopo when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. People in the remote community of Winjuan in East Sipik's Yanguru Saucia district now have access to a road for the very first time. Locals say the road has brought major improvements to their community as they go about their daily lives. Deli Waigeno with this report from Yanguru Saucia. Locals at Winjuan Village gratefully welcomed Yanguru Saucia MP and Minister for Trade, Commerce and Industry Richard Maru and his wife on Tuesday. The minister was there to officially open a newly constructed road. A local, Andy Wararo, described the daily hardships faced in accessing vital services before the road was built and thanked the MP for the initiative. Uh, but now you come up before you go amla money or same. Now you come up, you don't yeah. you will all get to come up the plate killer. Come up now. We play have a mass, we play your king on you. Lord from me play for all from me blah. No, she don't move blind me come a coup la over on you. Or send a mibla to thank you to my member. Minister Maru acknowledged the hardships faced by his people in the absence of infrastructure like roads and bridges. These people have waited for a very long time for a road. Yangur Sosa is on a, on a move, on a march. God is going before us and no one will stop our, our development below by Ronia. He urged the locals and their community leaders to care for the infrastructure and be receptive to more development. To show their appreciation, a houseman was built in Winjuan in the minister's honor to encourage deeper dialogue between the MP and his people. Till a house and mark him. Minister Richard Maru. The three-kilometer road that runs from Kumun to Winjuan was built at a cost of 150,000 kina from DSIP funds by contractor Hisik Construction. Minister Maru also appealed to the West Yanguru LLG president as well as the ward council members to invest their time in maintaining the roads for longevity. Deli Waigeno. National MTV News, East Sipic okay, Province. The Amstrad School Challenge continues in Port Moresby. The program comprises of debating challenges, a poetry slam for secondary and high schools, and a spelling bee for the primary school level. Yesterday's elimination round of debates saw Jubilee Catholic Secondary School and Port Moresby International School advance to the grand final. 
Officiated by Amstrad Holdings Limited, the Amstrad School Challenge began on Monday with the debate challenges on topics focusing on the United Nations Development Goals. Yesterday's elimination round saw Jubilee Catholic Secondary challenge Marinville Secondary and in the second elimination round, Koyari Park Adventist High School, a first-time contender and the only high school participating, challenged Port Mosby International School. In Today's round of debates Uncle. is in day number two of the Amstrad School Challenge. Advancing today are all participating UN, teams from you know, yesterday's round one in the Amstrad School Challenge. People Behind people me, debating is underway between Marinville's Catholic uh, Secondary uh, School uh, and Jubilee uh, Catholic uh, Secondary uh, School. Uh, Winning teams from this elimination uh, round will advance uh, into uh, the grand final to secure uh, a place uh, to uh, travel to uh, Honiara uh, and the Solomon uh, Islands to take part in the Melanesian debate challenge. Program founder and director Vani Nades shared with MTV that despite challenges faced in running the program due to limited funding, she persists with passion as she has since the previously known IBS inter-school debates. As this is a pilot program for Amstrad Holdings, Nades looks forward to expanding and including more schools in the nation's capital as well as other provinces. Next year we're going to branch out to various other provinces as well, so we will continue. And of course with this Amstrad Challenge too, with the debate, it's on an international arena as well. So from this debate we will be picking the best because to represent the participants to go to Solomon Islands. And um, on that note, we are also discussing on the Melanesian Youth, uh, youth Parliament as well. Apart from being a challenge forum for participants, the first two days of competition came out with evidence of youth empowering youth. Former student and speaker of Jubilee Catholic Secondary, Dagia Aka was a notable presence over the two days of competition, also sharing a motivational talk with participants. And when I got to Jubilee Catholic Secondary School, it was a whole different situation where we were finally given the opportunity to speak and talk about certain issues that we felt affected us. And that was where the interest initially started. Lorraine Gabina, National MTV News. Maprik District is establishing a resource center for women and youths. The initiative follows the district's goal to create income avenues and improve capacity building for people in Maprik. 100,000 kina from the district's Development Authority Fund was invested in building the center. The resource center will be built in Ulupu village, which is a 45-minute drive from Maprik town. Ulupu has an estimated population of over 35,000 people. Half of the population is women and children. Carol Pino, president of the Ulupu Women's Association, explained that this center will provide life skills training for Ulupu women and youths. On average, most girls in Ulupu do not further their education after grade 10. These girls turn into go coffee, cocoa or peanuts and sell to earn an income. The establishment of the center aims to minimize the verbal and physical discrimination Ulupu women face and give women the chance to make money and opportunity to participate in decision making. Maprik MP John Simon encouraged the villages to look after the center once completed and use it to access life skills. Apart from the center, the member promised to bring in electricity and road services into Ulupu. Takla Gunga, National MTV News. Alcohol and drug-related issues are on the rise in Maprik District. 
The Maprik Town Police Station receives three reports of alcohol or drug-related crimes every day. This month, close to 30 cases of assault on women reported to police were drug and alcohol-related. Senior Constable Vincent Maku said while it is a right for people to consume alcohol, they must do so responsibly. He said despite numerous surrendering of drugs and illegal alcohol brewing materials by Maprik's youth, alcohol and drug-related offences are still high. The 49 Tourism Working Group meeting commenced today in Kokopo. Delegates from APEC member economies arrived in Kokopo since Sunday. The Tourism Minister, Tobias Kulang, officiated at the gathering today, said PNG, particularly East New Britain, is privileged to have this international meeting held in the province for the first time since PNG first joined the APEC in 1993. The meeting will focus on discussing issues about how to improve and support tourism industry in the APEC member countries. The discussions of the meeting will be formulated into working plans for the PNG Tourism Authority to use. The meeting also comes at a time as the national government plans to transform East New Britain province into a tourism hotspot for the country. The event will continue over the next two days as one of many international meetings leading up to the 2018 APEC Summit in Port Moresby. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0 0.3080 US dollars, 0 0.4067 Australian dollars, 0.2732 Euro and 31.31 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, Gold, coffee and copra closed higher while cocoa closed the day lower. Crude oil and copper closed lower while palm oil closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 48.69 points lower. The ASX is trading at 39.09 points lower. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 37.73 points lower. You're with Wednesday's news. We'll have more local news and stories making headlines overseas up next. Welcome back to the news. The Chingwam rice farmers of Makam district in the Morbe province are the first local rice growers in the province to receive a check worth more than 15,000 kina from Trukai Rice Industries. The payment was for the 23 tons of rice the farmers harvested two weeks ago. This is the first opportunity the local farmers have ventured into and has converted 10 hectares of land into a rice field. Chingwang Rice Growers Cooperative Society started in 2010. Today, the society is made up of 400 local rice farmers in the Umi Achera area of Makam District. In December last year, the local farmers signed a rice purchasing and development agreement with Chuka Industries. Uh, last January, early this year, we were 10 hectares. Rice, pilot project, district area. The first rice payment trial carried out by the farmers was successful with the first payment of the harvest made yesterday. Project coordinator John Moran says this money will go towards the association to assist them increase production and in preparing for their second round of planting in December. Thank you, Trukai, for providing market. Uh, developing long-term relationship on them, Trukai. Trukai Industry CEO Greg Weddington says Trukai is now focusing on several key projects in the country, including the Chingwang Cooperative Society. Uh, in that uh, we can probably um, potentially have several thousand hectares uh, of rice growing through smallholder development uh, across the country within the next several years. Truka is now increasing this project to the other parts of the country. This is to give farmers a chance to grow rice as well as giving them the opportunity to generate income. So um, we're, we're poised now to start expanding these projects and start to deliver increased wealth to the rural society uh, in PNG. 
Matalubis National MTV News, Lei. A resource center in Lei has been established and is ready to use for human development, upskilling and training purposes. The resource center will be operating in the Ahi local level government area to help empower the Ahi people. The member for Lei, Lujaya Koza and Morbe Governor Kelly Naru opened the building. This new resource center will accommodate financial and literacy trainings and upskilling of human resource. The center was an initiative by the youths and women from Butibam village of IELLG with support from the Lay district office. The building will help cater the needs of women and youths in small and medium enterprises or SME. We are going to venture into Lay City and we are going to help all our mothers in Lay City to at least sell their crafts and make money for themselves to sustain their living. Social disturbances by youths have always been a concern in the area. With this centre, Butibam Community Enterprise Group will have the opportunity to engage in trainings for financial empowerment. All training programs where I all in Lea and by helping all youths to me plan, especially unemployment rate. The lay MP Lujaya Koza, who was also present during the opening ceremony, will work closely with areas in Lay District, especially organisations engaged in SMEs. The good governor of Morobe, He's going to bring his PEC meetings into here. Our good uh, deputy provincial administrator, our woman, Sheila Harrow, she's bringing her planning meetings into here. So we are going to give money back to the indigenous people. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lei. Turning overseas, the Islamic State group announced yesterday that one of its longest serving, most prominent leaders responsible for attacks overseas, Abu Muhammad al Adnani, has been killed in Aleppo province in Syria. Adnani had been one of the last living senior members, along with self appointed Caliph Abu Bakal Baghdadi, that founded the group and stunned the Middle East by seizing huge tracts of Iraq and Syria in 2014. The U.S. said it carried out an airstrike yesterday targeting him, saying a vehicle was hit in the Syrian town of Al-Bab, but didn't say whether they had confirmed the strike had killed him. As Islamic State spokesman, he was its visible member. As head of external operations, he was in charge of attacks overseas, including Europe, that have become an increasingly important tactic for the group as its core Iraqi and Syrian territory had been eroded by military losses. Advances by Iraq's army and allied militia towards Islamic State's most important position of Mosul have put the group under new pressure at the moment when a U.S.-backed coalition has cut its Syrian holdings off from the Turkish border. Those military setbacks have been accompanied by airstrikes that have killed several of the group's leaders, undermining its organizational ability and dampening its morale. A U.S. counterterrorism official who monitors Islamic State said that Adnani's death will hurt the militants in the area that increasingly concerns us as the group loses more and more of its support and its financial base and turns to mounting and inspiring more attacks in Europe, Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Under Adnani's command, Islamic State has launched large-scale attacks, bombings and shootings on civilians in several countries outside of its core area, including France, Belgium and Turkey. The official said Adnani's role as propaganda chief and director of external operations have become indistinguishable because the group uses its online messages to recruit fighters and provide instruction and inspiration for attacks. Islamic State news agencies reported that Adnani was killed while surveying the operations to repel the military campaigns against Aleppo. Islamic State holds territory in the province of Aleppo, but not in the city where rebels are fighting Syrian government forces. The agency did not say how Adnani, born Taha Subhi Falaha, in Syria's Idlib province in 1977, was killed. Islamic State published a eulogy dated August 29th, but giving no further details. Tennesonite, MTV World News. Here with National MTV News, we have the first day in the Rugby League Zone Championships in Lay. Stick around for that and more in Chukai Sports coming up next.
Welcome to Trukai Sports. In Rugby League, reigning champions the Northern Confederates are in for a hectic week of defending their under-18 title in the National Zone Championships in Leigh. This afternoon, they defeated their main rivals, the Southern, and walked over the Island Confederate in a 24-6 finish. Towards the end of the first half, the Northern Confederate had already stamped their mark on the field. The damp conditions making play slow and difficult at times. But when they ran towards the island's goal mouth, there was no stopping them. First a close call, then a try. The conversion successful play went on. Just before the first half, the islanders pushed closer to the northern try line, only to be stopped by the wall of purple. As the whistle went for half time, they still trailed on six points. The second half came with new resolve, but the Islanders were hammered yet again, the side plagued by mistakes and injuries. Then another nail in the coffin sealed the deal with this daring dash for the try line. The Northern Confederates ending the game 24-6. Scott Wyde, National MTV Sports, Lay. The CEO of the Coca-Cola Ipatas Cup, Timothy Lepa, has called on rugby league authorities to improve record-keeping related to players and officials who have been banned. Lepa was commenting on last weekend's on-field violence in Port Mosby, which Mount Hagen Eagle officials attacked match officials. Lepa highlighted that the official in question was previously banned in another league several years ago for a similar attack. The Eagle, some of these technical officials have been banned, but we don't have the record for the technical officials by the uh, general board. They don't have the record, but some of these technical officials have been banned in the other sanction competition by PNG Rugby League, but yet we involve them in, in the Eagles. Uh, and then that, you will feel sorry for this uh, young talent who have, you know, played very well this year. I have bet my some of the very young talent who played this year in the Eagles. Eagles have the most best team this year, but lacking experience. That's why they lost that. The recent violent actions of a Mount Hagen Eagles rugby league official at last weekend's semi-final match in Port Mosby has sparked serious questions of PNG as a host nation during the 2017 Rugby League World Cup. Last weekend's incident has made headlines on overseas media. Minister for Sports Justin Chachenko has expressed his utmost disgust at the behavior of the guilty club officials and says a lot had been invested to bring the national sport to the level it is now. Oh, is it going all the way? Oh. Yes, try time again. That's number six for the Hunters. He also said while there are positive aspects of the game's progression in recent times, this one act has brought the country into the spotlight for all the wrong reasons, bringing the game in disrepute. <laughs> PNG is to host the Rugby League World Cup 2017 along with Australia and New Zealand. Minister Chichenko ended on a high note saying, regardless of one or two individuals tarnishing the country's reputation, he will, in his capacity, ensure that the Rugby League World Cup goes ahead in Papua New Guinea. Elijah Lavet, National MTV Sports. You read Trukai Sports. More stories after the break. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Playing football at an early age of nine, PNG women's under-20 midfielder Yvonne Gabong made her debut on the international sta stage at the age of 13 when she was first selected to be part of an under-17 side that went to New Zealand. Upon returning, little did Gabong know, her international football appearance did not go unnoticed by the senior women's national team. By 2011, she was asked to join the PNG senior women's national team, where she started off as a flanker. 
A shy but fairly skilled footballer, Gabong and her team went on to win gold in the 2015 Pacific Games. The free kick, good hitter. Meets with you. Going up against New Caledonia, Lekagu was challenging and beating them was an unforgettable experience for the young footballer who was newly introduced to being a midfielder. By January this year, she was part of the senior team that took part in the World Cup qualifier against New Zealand, where PNG lost seven points to one in Ley. Gabong later played with the PNG under-20 side against USA and Japan in the Tri-Nations World Cup friendlies, which coincided with the OFC Nations Cup. Training continues for these young women as she prepares for the under-21 Women's World Cup, which is just two months away. Dini Rose Rico, National MTV Sports. Titan speed star and Kumul's winger Nene McDonnell has signed a three-year contract with the St. George Illawarra Dragons. The contract will see McDonnell join the club next season until the end of 2019. The 22-year-old, who is capable of playing on the wing or in the centre, is currently under contract to the Gold Coast Titans and has played 43 NRL to date. McDonnell made his first grade de debut from the for the Sydney Roosters rather during the 2014 season and has represented the PNG Kumuls on five occasions. The 2016 NRL All-Stars representative is expected to join the Dragons in November. And that's a wrap for Trukai Sports. The weather details when we come back. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, cloudy periods with chances of rain in Port Mosby, fine in Daru, brief evening showers in Kerama and Alotau, and thundery showers and rain in Popandeta. In the Momase region, thundery showers and rain in Lei, Wiwek and Vanimo, and brief showers clearing in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, passing thundery showers and rain in Lorengau, thundery showers and rain in Kavian, Kokopo and Rabao, some showers and rain in Kimbe and a shower or two in Buka. And in the Highlands region, cloudy with chances of few showers, then morning fog developing in all centres. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of PNG except for New Island. Waters of southern PNG Indonesia border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwa Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island and with waters of Finchhafen through Vitia Strait, Siasi Islands to Long Island to Karkar Island to Medang to Bogia to Wiwek, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands and with waters of New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 2 to 3 meters. Waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen and waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters west of Wiwek to Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesia border, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters and waters of New Island, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas rather rough to rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas rather rough with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots. Bismarck Sea, seas rather rough to rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slight with east to southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots.
The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. And before we go, families of missing persons in the autonomous region of Bougainville want a distant burial for loved ones who went missing during the civil war on the island. And they are calling on the government and those responsible to ensure that their loved ones are buried in their right places. Our journalist Fabian Hakalitz observed this event and brings us tonight's special report. Families of the missing persons in the autonomous region of Bougainville have once again united in commemorating the International Day of the Disappeared. These are families who lost their loved ones during the 10-year bloody conflict in Bougainville. This is the second year in which the International Day of the Disappeared has been commemorated here in the autonomous region of Bougainville. Families gathered here in Arawa to remember their loved ones who lost their lives during the Bougainville Civil War and to participate in this very important event. In central Bougainville, it began on Monday night with traditional chants and continued with a silent march around our town that concluded at the Independence Oval. The public were also able to view some pictures of those missing persons. Boca was this morning. Dorothy Cole Lobiasa from Tohati Village in the Hali constituency lost three of her brothers, Lawrence, George and Michael, during the Civil War. But through the process of identifying the missing persons, her families were able to repatriate remains of Lawrence and George. Last year, one But Michael is still missing, and she has hopes one day his remains will be found. Because one play walk long lose it, we play to no save. I'm stop long one ema. I feel long all who said to be my brother, no me my call. Please, me like him. I only talk out now me can me play play me like him. Kiss him one long him too. Scholastica Mirari has been working closely with the family of missing persons since 2014. She says that reconciliation is the way forward for lasting peace on the island. Only through reconciliation or only through means of retrieving, retrieving the, the bones and hand over to the families and it needs a full participation. So the, the ABG is currently engaged in a process to try and address the issue of missing persons. Um, there's a consultative committee that's meeting on a, on a regular basis to discuss the way forward on this issue. Um, and the ICRC is providing technical support, advice to the, to the ABG. Um, it, the, the issue of missing persons is something that the ICRC has a fair degree of expertise in, um, given that we've addressed the issue in a lot of contexts around the world. Now, there's hope for families of the missing persons, and all they want is for their loved ones be given a proper and decent burial in Arawa Fabian Hakalitz, National MTV News. And that's been the news, sports and weather for tonight. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.